Hey guys, Jim again, and I am starting a new series today, a little mini series here, because after 10 billion complaints that I haven't read Harry Potter, I'm finally gonna do it and cover each chapter. So starting with book one, chapter one, I'm just gonna kind of keep track of my notes and thoughts and anything that really kind of stands out to me, because I think if I do decide to do more deep dives into the Harry Potter universe, it will be helpful to have these sorts of things. Plus, I think it's just kind of a fun discussion to have. I don't like to rely on other people's notes. That's why I really don't deal with books a lot because I have dyslexia so it takes a long time for me to read and get through certain things but we're gonna give this a try and sometimes I might not have a new episode every week. Sometimes it might be two or three weeks between episodes depending on how long and complicated a chapter is. But <laughs> um, to go over my notes I started my own special notebook for Harry Potter. <laughs> What really stuck out to me in the beginning of the book uh, is the first chapter, pretty much half of it, is from the Dursleys perspective. There's a lot of focus on the Dursleys for people that we're not supposed to like very much. And of course, Mr. Dursley works at Grunnings, which is a place that makes drills. And Mrs. Dursley turns out to be more of a Gladys Kravitz type than I would have imagined from the movies. But we have this situation where we're being told about this very average family who hates anything out of the normal, and here are these large owls showing up all over the place, shooting stars coming out of the sky, a bunch of people in cloaks wandering around and talking to people like they should not be. I don't know why suddenly the wizarding world is off the table and they're all in the regular world, but uh, I mean, come on, if you don't want people to know you exist, this is a really bad way to go about it. And something I'm still not sure about, when they kept referring to shooting stars, did they mean legit stars falling out of the sky or is that some British slang for fireworks? Because I don't know a ton of British slang to really catch a bunch of things, I assure you. Oh, then it finally switches over to Dumbledore kind of taking over the story with McGarnagle. And forgive me, I'm gonna butcher some of these names because my throat's already dry and I can't speak because I has the dyslexia. So sometimes I just look at these names and it's like blah, 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 blah. And they say Daedalus Diggle is the one who is probably responsible for the shooting stars and I think I wrote that name down because it stuck out to me as one I did not recognize. But Dumbledore lands on on Privet Drive and he is using his put outer to flick away all the street lights. He mentions that it's been 11 years and they've had no cause to celebrate in the wizarding world and that he spent the past 11 years trying to tell people to say Voldemort instead of you know who. Which I thought that's interesting. They don't say he who shall not be named or something which is even more grandiloquent than you know who but for whatever reason, that's what it says so far. And McGarnagle says that Voldemort is afraid of Dumbledore, which does make a suggestion that Dumbledore would be more powerful, but I I don't think that's it. I have seen all the movies, so I kind of know what's ahead, but I know there's a lot more in the books that I don't know about, so I'm not going to speculate too much right now. But I have a feeling that that goes back to when Voldemort was a child. And at this point, everybody knows that Harry somehow broke Voldemort's powers, but they don't know how or why. And this stuck out to me because I did a movie based theory on this before but when Dumbledore is getting ready to leave Harry behind and you know it's little baby Harry wrapped up in his swaddling clothes there he says it's the best place for him referring to the Dursley's home and he later goes on to say well we don't want him to grow up with this big head basically believing that he's the best thing ever and he hasn't even had a chance to figure out you know how to speak you know it's too much pressure it's too easy to corrupt him type of thing is the impression I got which is basically the theory I put out a year or two ago. But part of that theory was also that the Dursleys were not really bad people before Harry and that Dumbledore kind of manipulated that to make Harry into such this good, caring, moldable young man. Again, though, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I have no idea what's coming in the next chapter, so it's all a surprise for me. And I noticed that Dumbledore never really likes to answer anything directly. He's always like, oh, it seems so. Oh, yeah, that might be the case. Oh, you know, this is what's best, whatever shall be shall be type of answers, which is interesting, especially if he has as much of a plan as I believe he does, but we'll see how that goes. Then there's Hagrid, 
who is described as two times taller and five times wider than a normal man. And I don't know, I just keep wanting to see the actor of Hagrid and he is definitely not that out of the ordinary, but I have trouble physically trying to picture Hagrid. And he mentions his motorcycle that he borrowed is from Sirius Black. So even right away in the first chapter, we have a character that's gonna come back in book three, I think. But the fact that Hagrid had borrowed the motorcycle, obviously that means that Sirius has not been demonized and sent off with the Dementors at this point. He is Azkaban free. Another bit that caught my eye here was that Dumbledore refuses to even try to remove Harry's scar. He's just like, oh, a scar can come in handy. I have a scar above my knee. That's this exact map for London. And then Dumbledore just leaves Harry with a letter unsupervised on the doorstep in the middle of the night for the Dursleys to find in the morning. Just sincerely, WTF. He couldn't do a phone call. He couldn't send a real letter in advance and wait a couple of days. He he had to just surprise them and go, here's a baby. Hope you don't hate him, even though you already hate him. There seems to be a lack of sense in that plan and I, I don't quite get it. It just seems so careless and irresponsible that I don't quite get it. I mean, obviously Harry is an extremely important infant here, so you can't even let people know he's on his way. And it really makes me debate whether that letter was enchanted in some way, because if it was me, even if I thought I was the best person in the universe if I go to open the door and there's some baby there that I don't really know or recognize and he's only accompanied by a letter. I mean, I'm gonna call the police. I'm gonna call probably a social worker. I might call the fire department. I mean, people are gonna get involved and I'm probably not gonna retain custody of that kid, especially not if I already have a baby. That just seems like a lot to put on somebody without asking them first. But then again, I'm one of those people that feel like the whole concept of blood relations are just ridiculous. Let's see, we could put a child with an adoptive family who would really love him even if they're muggles and treat him right and at least, you know, bring him up with some form of happiness and family. Or we could leave him with these people that are seen to be awful human beings apparently and just hope for the best. I really feel like Dumbledore's plan was to make Harry be a humble individual growing up and that was the best way to do it. We're gonna withhold love and compassion and empathy and everything from you. And then that way, when you get to Hogwarts, you're gonna be so desperate for affection and approval that you're gonna basically bend over backwards to do whatever we want. Maybe I'm wrong. I guess uh, we'll see as I peel through chapter by chapter, but that's the impression I got out of the movies. And so far that's the impression that I'm getting out of the book. Also, I guess I should probably mention this because it's a bit of a hot topic right now. I am recording this on June 22nd, 2020. So I don't know exactly when I'm gonna publish it or what channel I'm gonna publish it on at this point, honestly. Could be the fangirl or the fanly, but I am vaguely aware of the issues going on with JK Rowling. Like I'm not in the middle of it. I don't really go and deep dive for it. I've said, hey, what's going on? And had some people say, she's this, she's that, this is happening. This is, you know, it's, it's a whole weird thing. I've debated whether or not to even try to do this series chapter by chapter because of it, but ultimately I think the Harry Potter fandom is more important than the author. Yes, she wrote it. Yes, she benefits from people talking about it, but at the end of the day, it has become such a huge thing across the whole planet that I'm not going to let one person or opinions that might not be popular or a person that might not be popular, I guess, really ruin something for me that I've been pushed and pushed and pushed into into getting into. I said when these books got super popular as the movies were coming out and I was in high school at that point to age myself horribly here. Oh, but yeah, I said, I am not getting into it because I've gotten into Pokemon. I've gotten into Lord of the Rings. I've gotten into all of these other things that are kind of like not exactly fads, but really at the time it felt like Lord of the Rings and Pokemon were hitting their peak and they were going to die down. You know, who could have predicted that Pokemon would go up and down and up and down and up and down in popularity forever. But that's why I avoided Harry Potter initially. Then I had dyslexia like set in really difficultly. So I difficultly. Yeah. But yeah, I have to read so many paragraphs over and over again to get it. But my camera is about to die. So I'm going to cut this off now and I will see you in the next chapter. Please subscribe and check it out again. Yay. 
Thanks for watching! Well, family members, we're almost done, but I want to invite you to hang out with me in some other places. I'm on Twitter and Instagram as my own personal self, and I have a Facebook page too, but I mostly just post photos over there. And sometimes people say, hey, McGann, I want to mail you something. How do I do that? Easy. Just click the About tab on my channel page, and my most current P.O. Box info will be right there. I also run another channel, The Family. It's really a hodgepodge channel where we might post anything. Oh yeah, and I also sell shirts and stickers and stuff with the family and the fangirl logos. If that is your cup of tea, I have a link in every description of every video. Finally, if you want to help out the fangirl channel and make sure I'm putting out video essays for years to come, the best way you can help is by subscribing and watching more of my videos, whether they're new, old, whatever. Maybe even share one or two on social media, help spread the word. People who watch to the end of videos like you helps to tell the site, hey, this is a good video. We should recommend it to other people. So if you made it this far, leave me a comment of something like, hey, I made it to the end. Love ya. See you next time, family members. Bye.